Welcome everybody to the Junior Leadership Lake Norman program. It's gonna be virtual today. And I, I'm sorry, I was just sharing with everybody. We had a fantastic in-person program finally lined back up. We were gonna go over to the Homewoods. Well, first a program uh, of Visit Lake Norman upstairs, then go over to the Homewood Suites, then head over to the Davidson Village Inn, come back here for lunch with uh, tenders and then head over to the Huntersville Family Fitness and Aquatic Center and then head over to the Raptor Center and the inclement weather, we the threat of ice and rain and snow and, and sleet and all that mixed in uh, was a little bit scary. So we pulled the plug and made a virtual meeting. But I think this is gonna be a great presentation and uh, I wanna welcome Zach Brown. Zach actually went through our Leadership Lake Norman program. Before you actually talk about the Huntersville Family Fitness Aquatic Center, Zach, uh, share what you got out of the adult version of Leadership Lake Norman. Absolutely. Yeah, it was, uh, it was quite the experience. You know, there's, there's certain aspects of it that you, uh, you kind of think you know what you're going to get out of it on a day-to-day -day basis, but it was, um, it was, it was nice to, to be able to connect with multiple people in the various facets of business and leadership roles and various roles, whether it be hospital systems or, or honestly, even some companies that I didn't really know about that existed in this area, um, to better understand the infrastructure. So, um, you know, I went in thinking that I would get a specific outcome that I knew what I thought I knew and certainly left uh, eyes more wide open as to really how uh, how everything works and what it takes to get things to work. So uh, a great experience to be able to interact with a lot of those different types of people and uh, still have bonds with all of them today. Um, so I think now it's been two years, mm -hmm. ish, two, three years, maybe. So, um, yeah, certainly. Uh, certain experience that I, I think everyone, if they have the opportunity, should try to participate in. Right. Well, Zach, you actually manage and operate the Huntersville Family Fitness Aquatic Center. Uh, you now have administrative controls. If you'll share with our students over the next 20 minutes, what is the Huntersville Family Fitness Aquatic Center? What resources do you have there? And why might a family from Huntersville or the surrounding region want to, want to uh, enroll and become a member? Absolutely. I'll go ahead and... Uh, share my screen here and uh, take you through a baseline presentation. Um, we do a lot of different types of presentations uh, throughout the course of a, of a given year to kind of enlighten individuals, not only, uh, like you said, what exists inside the facility, but uh, as well as kind of how we work because it is a little bit dynamic to not only this area, but, but honestly countrywide on on the type of partnership that exists. Um, we are located in Huntersville off of Veerhoff Drive across the, the road from the Huntersville Rec Center and the uh, CPCC campus. I think I said enough C's there. Um, so certainly what I like to do is kind of give a baseline, a very broad stroke baseline as to uh, how we got to today from the, from the beginning of the facility. So to kick off, I'm assuming everyone can see that screen okay. Um, the facility, the, the idea of the facility really started back in 1997 when the, the town was considering general viability for swimming, fitness, general recreation to attempt to bring the community together. And as I'm sure you hear for, for many uh, large scale projects, it, it doesn't happen overnight, certainly. So between the idea of the building from what you see there, the logo up top there, the Huntersville Community Center, through architecture, engineering and the like, uh, which happened very heavily through 98, 99, town approving and construction beginning. It took until about 2000, or it took until 2001 until the facility actually uh, opened its doors. To do that, however, there's a lot of partners that were involved. Um, you see some of them listed here, an old, old photo uh, from, from when it was kicking off groundbreaking, if you will, and, and a lot of the individuals that were involved, at least in that photo, uh, listed there underneath the, the picture, but it was a collaboration between the county because the facility sits on county land. It's actually leased uh, to the county or leased by the county to us. Um, a lot of large scale business providers as well. You see Presbyterian Hospital listed there. Now Novant Hospital System was involved really from the groundbreaking in day one. And obviously the, the various commissions that were involved to kind of get us to where we are. And um, the exciting part is with all of that involved, although it took a few years to get to this point in 2001, uh, came into the opening and, and Bill, I, uh, I borrowed the picture you the chamber posted up about a month ago, 
uh, had not seen that before, but for everyone watching, the picture on top is actually the ribbon cutting for the facility. And you can see that your very own Bill Russell is standing there as well for that event. Um, and you can see underneath that the, the coupon or, or advertisement, if you will, that was available at that time to uh, get people into the facility. Um, the interesting part is, for the most part, the foundation of the facility hasn't changed drastically in regards to what it was from the original plan. It is slightly larger than 88,000 square feet today. Um, that was due to really one room addition from what the, the final plan was at that time. Um, but honestly, the interior of what happens on a day-to-day -day base has drastically changed as the years have progressed. So with, along with that change has come a couple different iterations of identity and branding. So I mentioned before, it was originally the Huntersville Community Center had uh, shifted over to the, to the title and the logo that you see there in the middle of the screen to officially Huntersville Family Fitness and Aquatics. And then finally, the bottom logo is what we, we operate with today um, as, again, same general name, but just a little bit of a different updated look. Um, as I mentioned, however, the, the building uh, sits on Beerhoff Drive, uh, owned by the town of Huntersville on county land, and at the current time managed by a company called Swim Club Management Group. Um, a lot of different individuals and groups that are involved. So I'll kind of talk a little bit more in depth on that and give you a broad stroke overview of what Swim Club Management is. Um, most of the business really where Swim Club Management kicked off was on uh, lifeguard management and uh, maintenance services for HOA facilities that had pools, country clubs, and the like. Uh, that has grown drastically to uh, manage construction, uh, general technical services for those types of facilities also grew into what we're doing here at HFFA, which is full facility management, uh, whether it be aquatics, fitness, children's services, and the like. But across our various companies, you can see some of the statistics that are listed there that are ever-changing on a day-to-day -day basis, um, has, has always been in Huntersville and uh, has, has really expanded now, uh, has a large foothold in North Carolina, Virginia, and obviously very soon here, hopefully into other areas of the Southeast. So again, broad stroke of what swim club management is, but more specifically inside HFFA, quite a bit. And I usually tell people that there's three main areas uh, or business units that operate inside the building. Aquatics, which again, it's in our name. Fitness, also in the name of the facility. And to support all that, uh, children's services as well. There's quite a few that, that come with that. What you see for the most part is heavy aquatics. There's a 50 meter pool, so an Olympic sized pool, a smaller 25 yard warm water pool, a therapy pool. Um, that's where you see a lot of your group exercise classes as well. Uh, intertwined with the large pool is diving. And there'll be a picture here I'll show you in just a moment uh, as to some of the, the equipment that the dive group utilizes. There's an outdoor splash pad pool, which only operates during the summertime season. Then I'll shift into fitness. There's multiple fitness studios to support cycling, yoga, dance, um, strength classes. Um, and one of the newest things that we obviously brought to the table when we came in and started operating at the facility in 2017 was a program called HFFA Strong, which is for a quick terminology, if you will, uh, a boot camp style class that operates in our gymnasium space. And you'll see a picture of that soon. And then as I mentioned down in the, the middle bottom, is some of our kids' services. So on a normal year, and we'll talk about what normal compared to now is like, but um, on a normal year, we'd have preschool children, uh, like a child watch program. Um, we also do summer camps and, and things of that nature. So a lot of different business units that have to collaborate in one. Um, this image I mentioned, uh, there's a 50 meter pool. You're seeing this pool now, and it's a set up short course. So there is the ability for us to make it for those that desire to want to swim um, the length without having a wall, uh, we can do long course. And on the far end of the picture where you see the American flag and the state flag is uh, some of our platforms that we use for, for diving. And the picture doesn't really do it justice, but the where you see the American flag hanging is actually a 10 meter board or a 10 meter platform. Um, that's that's um, about 30 feet from the surface level of the water to that point where someone would be jumping off. So um, certainly very impressive and takes a, a brave soul with a lot of practice to utilize those, those items. But um, we have a dive program in house that, that does it on a daily basis and a lot of different user groups that utilize this, this pool. 
Um, again, I mentioned the smaller pool, the 25 yard pool, that's the upper left picture you can see on your screen. The outdoor splash pad, or at least a version thereof, is on the bottom right. Uh, the top right is one of our studio spaces, and the bottom left is uh, the strong program that was launched here at the facility inside what used to be the, the full court basketball space inside the building. One of the reasons why that change occurred was to be in collaboration with the town of Huntersville when they were actually building the Huntersville Rec Center across the street from HFFA, which uh, has obviously brand new multiple courts that could be configured for not only basketball courts, uh, volleyball, pickleball, and things of that nature. So for us, it made sense to really target more of the, the fitness offerings. Broad stroke, however, in regards to how the building operates. Again, I usually tell individuals it takes a lack of terminology here. I would say a small city, right? So there's uh, administrative, which really does a lot of the budgeting, um, helps to kind of guide the overall vision of the facility. Children's services, I mentioned, you can see the various items that I had already mentioned before that they touched upon. Aquatics, uh, guest services or member management, fitness, obviously, and then the support staff around all of that, uh, maintenance and housekeeping to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the uh, membership. But um, if you recall earlier on, I said that uh, the building is owned by the town of Huntersville. And so we are the management company that operates it on a day-to-day -day basis. However, we have to operate within the rules of town municipal operation. And so we are what's called an enterprise fund where essentially every time we budget, our expenses must match our revenue. Even if we plan for an excess revenue at the end of the year, that budget must match to what the guidelines are for enterprise fund. That budget is then agreed upon by the town board. Um, and that's the budget that we operate under. And that's the group that essentially we answer to, to operate it appropriately under a balanced budget. Um, now, some of the numbers you'll see in this program uh, moving forward are pre-COVID numbers. So prior to March of 2020, we did have about 9,300 members. Um, that number obviously would fluctuate on a given season. Um, and, and it's about 60,000 visitors to various economic impact events, whether that be tournaments and, and competitions specifically. Uh, there's sponsors that help to provide funding for the building. Uh, obviously where we are um, have quite a bit of our revenue, uh, typically, over 60% of our revenue comes from a membership base. Um, and then we have various types of memberships and scholarships available. And then we still attempt to collaborate with the county as much as possible. Uh, obviously, it's a very, it's a great deal in regards to the land lease. Uh, and certainly they, they helped um, to, to provide some funding from time to time. They, they most recently gave about one and a half million dollars in 2016 to help with some capital improvements with the facility. So, Certainly, uh, whenever those opportunities arise, we, we go after those. We knew, however, coming into the building that we needed to really look at overall member impact. And these are some early shots from the facility when we walked in and we knew that we wanted to make some changes to do what we could to be more appealing to the overall membership base. So we launched the energy bar. Um, this is generally what it would look like today if it were an operation. Um, and we targeted the extra member benefits of being a member, such as smoothies and supporting some of the, the live events that come into the facility. We also took a look just at general aesthetics and how things were structured within the, the building. You see in the, the top picture there, a bunch of spin bikes uh, lining the hallways. We've now removed those and created some seating pods to create a, basically a destination, if you will, more so than just a, a one-stop shop for certain items capital project that hasn't been utilized in uh, all its glory as of yet because this finished just about the time that we were coming into the winter season and then uh, the COVID impact occurred. Now, this is a playground that also exists on the property and then a little bit more of an in-depth look uh, and some various shots of the, the strong room as that is uh, at this time the largest membership draw and then one of the largest reasons that people join the facility is to utilize that space. Um, but besides all of that, we certainly have quite a few other programs that are occurring. We um, launch what's called Rocksteady Boxing, and, and we work as, as best we can with the hospital systems as well. This is the program specifically targeted to individuals with Parkinson's. And so we uh, started out really with just one person who was willing to travel from quite a distance to 
Now I think we're close up to about 40 individuals that travel from all over the region to partake in this program, uh, a unique program that is offered elsewhere as well, but uh, certainly had not been at the facility uh, prior to, to us coming in to help operate it and creating some very, very positive impacts. Uh, we also did a full revamp of the website. So this is the website that you would see today uh, to go through and, and um, see all the various things we have to offer and the general overall layout, talking about classes and memberships and the like. We also have uh, launched a phone app, which will actually be going through another iteration here this year. Uh, we're gonna be making some changes to that to make it more user-friendly, uh, not only for COVID times with reservations, but also just better communication with our membership. So quite a busy year in 2017, 18, to get that up and running. And that, that really helped to drive a lot of our membership. But on the opposite side of membership and the support of that are some of the, the in-house programs and various, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the economic impact event. So you see listed there, we do have a dive program. Um, it operates year round, utilizes the springboards as you would see at a typical pool, as well as platforms. And, and a lot of these individuals uh, start very young and, and move up through the ranks that they are, they are potentially able to compete even on a international level. Um, so it's, it's quite impressive to see what these individuals are able to do. But along with that, um, on a, and again, a normal year, we would have quite a few groups that we would bring in to, to run, whether it be triathlon race series, uh, regional and um, national events with whether it be diving um, or even swimming events. Powerade State Games was supposed to come in uh, just this past year. Unfortunately, had to call that off due to, due to COVID. And we're actually happy to say that uh, we, we expanded our high school athletic association agreement. Um, we were able to host the regional swimming competition in our immediate area, uh, which typically isn't hosted here just for various logistical reasons. But we're happy to be able to, to support that initiative here coming to the end of the swimming high school season this year. Also quite a few partners that are involved. Um, these are what I'll call our financial partners that um, you can see listed generally on sponsorship level. Um, we have Atrium Health, uh, who's our, our medical sponsor for the facility. So Mac, obviously our swimming partner, um, Hambright, local vet services, and, and I won't go through each individual one, but in some facet uh, or another, these are specific groups that provide some, some financial support and um, different programs throughout the course of the year to kind of help bolster the facility and, and hopefully provide more services to the town of Huntersville and the, the general community. Uh, let's see, moving forward, I wanted to talk briefly about COVID and the impact that it's had uh, overall on our facility. So we're operating quite strong. Month over month, we had a, a lot of positive things coming down the pipeline from a membership standpoint. Um, and unfortunately, when COVID hit, we had to shut our doors back in uh, March of 2020. We weren't really able to open up any operations until uh, June uh, coming after that closure. And even then, it was only some of our select pool offerings and then really weren't able to move forward on anything else until the fall winter coming into the September, October timeframe. So there's quite a bit of effort put into what we needed to do to uh, plan for a reopening. So, uh, you know, I could go ad nauseum as to all the things that have changed over, but certainly we looked at a lot of the other uh, businesses that were in operation to understand what, what that level of expectation for cleanliness would be and what we needed to do to make sure we were given the best um, experience possible under the latest restrictions, which frankly were changing uh, quite frequently in the earlier days of uh, reopening. So trying to navigate that and certainly navigate the, the challenges of item procurement, um, staffing models, and what was most appropriate here, especially um, uh, for a gym operation once we finally got to that point. So we did a few unique things. If there was uh, anything positive that, that for us came out of COVID was uh, it forced us to innovate, which we hadn't really been forced to do in some facets before because uh, times were good. And so one of the things we did was, uh, much like you see uh, around the world, is, is created an online platform through YouTube to try and provide some fitness offerings. Um, and that, from, from day one of what it looked like to what it looks like today, is, is drastically different. We learned quite a bit in that uh, innovation time period. And then obviously following all the guidelines uh, have done a lot of things. Um, to make the space COVID safe. Now, uh, full transparency, the pictures you see here are uh, pre-mask requirements inside the fitness space. Um, so 
uh, it does look even more different today with some of those changes. But certainly, we, we separated space out. We took equipment offline. We took studio space that typically wasn't utilized for fitness center and other things and, and made them available. Uh, bought new equipment for cleaning aspects um, to create that environment. And certainly throughout all of that, no matter how or what changes you did, you would see a, a major impact to your membership base. But um, overall, we knew the importance of the items that you see listed on the screen. Provide a, a positive member experience and a safe and clean environment while following all the COVID safety protocols, and we would still see continued um, financial success. And, and happy to say that even as of today, um, with what we've been able to do in, in true expense management, uh, it does appear, and I'll say it, I'm knocking on some wood here in my office, uh, that we may be able to still break even on our budget. So future plans, obviously, is to continue to update, plan accordingly. Uh, we spent a lot of more time on training than probably we ever have to guarantee a uh, positive operation. And like I said, it allowed us to innovate not only in, in specific offerings, but things like online reservation systems and things of that nature. So I'm um, excited to get back to some semblance of normal as the rest of the world um, and get back to um, the way we were looking in late 2019, early 20. But um, that is the, the quick snapshot of the facility. And, and what I'll say is um, certainly anyone on the call or anybody that's recorded, if, if at any point you, you want to come by and uh, take a tour, uh, myself and or the team would be happy to do that um, and, and let you see inside the walls. Many of you may have visited under various programs, but um, certainly want to make sure I extend that out um, just in case you had and would like to. So, All Bill, right. with that, um, I've been trying to keep to a tight timetable for you. Um, I'll go ahead and do a stop share there. Well, we, I know you've got another meeting you're, you're jumping off to. So thank you very much, Zach. And I will, uh, we'll see you next Thursday for the adult leadership, Lake Norman. And hopefully that won't get preempted by any kind of bad weather. Absolutely. I appreciate it. And, uh, pleasure uh, speaking with everyone today. All right. Take care, sir. Thank you. Um, all right, we're going to go back to uh, Mariano, and uh, Mariano, I'm going to see where you jumped off to here. I'm going to have you come in and uh, make you a co-host, and you'll be able to share your screen and tell a little bit about the Davidson Village Inn, um, one of our really nicer, I would say, boutique hotels uh, that... Uh, is able to serve as Davidson College, uh, the families who visit there, MSC, and some others. So, Mariano, uh, do you want to share a little bit about the uh, uh, your property? Absolutely. And um, can everybody see my screen okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Fantastic. So, we are a little 18-room uh, boutique property in the heart of downtown Davidson. Uh, what's really special about us, besides our service, in which we take tremendous pride, is how close we are to our you know, historic downtown area. Um, the inn has been here for over 25 years. Uh, my wife and I were lucky enough to uh, become a part of this community and own the inn since October of 2017. Um, and it was our dream. It was our dream to uh, come to a town like this one, to a community like Lake Norman uh, and own a place that meant so much to the community uh, and that is, uh, that is so loved by its guests. Uh, so it's, it's really a joy to be here, despite, of course, uh, what you all know uh, has been COVID-19 and the impact uh, that it's had in our property. So I'm going to take you through a very um, brief virtual tour. Uh, as opposed to the Aquatic Center, uh, we don't have a lot of facilities outside of our lobby dining room area and our rooms, uh, which is why we are an inn, uh, not a resort or a hotel. Uh, and oftentimes calls it, called a bed and breakfast as well because guests come because they want a place to sleep, somewhere to have breakfast and then get to enjoy um, everything that um, Davidson has to offer. So I'm just gonna take you to a brief tour here of our rooms. Uh, what's really special about us is that although we only have 18 rooms, uh, we have five different room categories. Uh, so if you're traveling on your own and you want something like a queen room, we've got that. Uh, if you're traveling with your friend and you need something like a twin room, uh, we've got that as well. Uh, if you're traveling with your family because you need more space, you want two queen beds, 
Uh, we have our family suites, uh, which also have a kitchenette um, and a lounge area. As you can see right here, we have the, the little lounge area, the kitchenette you can't see uh, because it's behind this area, but then you have two queen beds there as well. And what's really cool is that these rooms are all designed to meet uh, the different needs uh, of our guests. We also have the executive suite. So if you're in a large family group, uh, the executive suite actually connects with our twin rooms. So let's say you're a family of five, you have two kids in the twin room, you have a baby in a day bed that we have within the executive suite, and we still have that uh, queen bed there. That room also has um, a kitchenette area as well as a lounge area. And then we have our most popular, which are the king rooms. Uh, the king rooms have a king size bed. Uh, they're traditionally corner rooms, so they have a little bit more uh, space or a little bit more spacious. Uh, and they all fit in within the profile of our guests. Um, albeit that we are in the small town of Davidson, um, we have the privilege of hosting people that come into the college, uh, whether it be students that want to see what Davidson College is all about, whether it be uh, parents uh, coming in for different meetings at the school or to you know watch their kids play different sports, uh, or whether it be uh, coaches and, and staff and administrators that are being recruited by the college. So we're very fortunate to have the college within literally 50 steps um, of the end. We also um, have the luxury of, because of our location and its proximity uh, to all these wonderful things in, in the historic part of Davidson, uh, we get a lot of uh, corporate travelers uh, during the week. So between Sunday night and Thursday night, it's primarily corporate travel um, business that comes in either to meet with the folks at um, Lowe's Home Improvement or Ingersoll Rand, uh, Train Technologies or other companies that are all within one mile, one and a half miles um, of our facilities, which, which is tremendous for us, especially during those um, weekdays. And then we have the remaining business that comes in to enjoy um, the town. So with that said, I'm gonna show you here a little video of some of the things that are um, available to our guests when they stay at the end. So I'm gonna play this.
So I think that's a great way to, you know, get a feel for what we offer, which is really showcase the town of Davidson and everything that's important uh, to our community. Uh, one more thing that it's, I think it's important to discuss is COVID-19 has completely shifted uh, the way that um, you follow certain business practices. Uh, it gets you to be more creative. It helps you identify other ways to, to generate revenues. And more importantly, it forces you to look for best practices that actually help uh, in preserving the safety and health of our staff and our guests. Uh, we had to implement a wide array of um, measures that we're not going to go in detail with, but it just forced us to step up our game. And as you'll see here, uh, we got to enjoy in 2020 uh, Inspector's Best of Housekeeping, uh, which is awarded only to the top 20% of properties around the world. Uh, we got a five-star full-on rating from TripAdvisor even becoming an editor's choice property in the Lake Norman area. And we got 100% sanitation rating uh, from the Environmental Health Department. So these were all things that we had to take care of. We wanted to make sure that our staff, our guests would be healthy. And it also allowed us to stay open. So despite the fact that we did not have a lot of people uh, come in and stay, those that needed a place to stay uh, had the opportunity to stay in a small, um, quaint, you know, family uh, run and operated property, which makes a difference in how you make uh, our guests feel. And um, I just wanna conclude by saying that, uh, you know, I mentioned about us changing our practices. Uh, we also had to get creative in, in the regard of what do we do to generate, you know, different revenues while we're closed. Uh, so with that in mind, we started a program called Vine Society. Uh, and we took some of our bookshelves that were traditionally used for you know, classic books uh, and stuck them up with amazing wines from all over the world. Uh, and we started doing uh, wine classes uh, for our community. We also started uh, working on deep dive tasting. So people that wanted to explore a particular grape varietal or a region, they could do that. Uh, and before we knew it, we were doing uh, master sommelier events uh, for corporations. We got to work with, um, SHB law firm in Charlotte, where we did two different events for their national audience. Uh, we now have an event for them for the automotive industry uh, that's coming up in March. Uh, we did events for MetLife and Prudential. And before we knew it, we were kind of, you know, carrying a very local concept uh, and turning it into a um, national program that uh, has already started to reap great benefits uh, and great publicity for us. So I'm, I'm really proud of that because it just kind of took us completely out of our comfort zone uh, and got us into diff and to doing different things. Uh, just yesterday, two people walked up the street and say, hey, I hear you have great wines here. Um, you know, so I, I think that's phenomenal. And one of the other things I tell our community is, you know, if you have three frogs on a lily pad uh, and they're in the moat of this king's castle and two uh, decide to jump into the water, uh, how many uh, frogs are left? Anybody want to take a guess? One. Oh, so logically, right, Bill? You'd have one because mathematically two decided. The thing is that the keyword there is decided. It doesn't really mean that they actually jumped in the water. So for all those people that are trying to decide that they're going to come and support our small business, we tell them, take the jump, come check out our wines. And I think you'd be very, very happy with what you see. So with that, I, you know, unfortunately, I don't have that much more to present to you guys. Uh, but I think it uh, articulates what we're all about, uh, where we are, and how much this community and, and Lake Norman overall uh, means to our business. Thank you, Mariano. And I think the thing that's uh, I think's always been so nice about the Davidson Village Inn is that you're if, if when you check into the inn, you have all those amenities that you just talked about. Some of the nicest restaurants that we have in the Lake Norman region are right there in Davidson downtown. And they're within walking distance. So you can walk over to the campus, take a little stroll, go to dinner, then go back to the room and you never have to get in the car. Exactly. Absolutely. Everything, we measure them in steps, not in miles. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and uh, switch gears and we're going to go over. Uh, if you'll uh, stop sharing your screen, Mariano, we're going to turn it over to Jim Warren. And uh, Jim is with the Carolina Raptor Center.
And we've got some fantastic changes uh, coming over to uh, the Raptor Center. Jim, do you, um, I'm going to make you a co-host. And so you'll be able, uh, like everybody else, to be able to share your computer. But you have a fantastic resource coming to Lake Norman. Talk about that. And the Raptor Center is, is a place that, that serves the whole Southeast right here in Huntersville. Yeah, and thanks, Bill, and welcome to everyone. And we're just so happy to be a part of this program. We've been a tour site and a supporter of both uh, the sort of junior leadership, uh, Lake Norman, and well, leadership, Lake Norman, for a number of years. And a number of our board members have been through the program. And so we're very, very uh, fortunate, and thank you. Um, we do see ourselves as a destination. Uh, we're not just this uh, amenity for locals. We get folks from all over the world. Um, and COVID has affected us. Uh, we just were closed a couple weeks ago as part of the Mecklenburg County Directive. We reopened. And of course, the weather today is not very conducive. Um, but we're still open. And even during the closure for COVID, when we were closed from March the 15th through July 1, we still were not closed because we had live animals. And so we could have anywhere from 100 to 200 birds that we're treating seven days a week, 365 days a year. We're, the hospital never closes. And so that continued the expense without the revenue. But I'm gonna start on the positive. Um, I want everybody to think positive technology thoughts because you probably have the least savvy sharing person in the whole world on this thing right now. Normally I have the benefit of having a couple other staff on the call and I just sort of talk and they drive it. So we'll see. I've got my PowerPoint ready. I'm going to go into save mode and see if I can find it there. It looks like that is it. Um, I can't. Oh, can you guys see that? Can anybody see it? Got it. Excellent. I did it. You so let see me see it. if I can make it actually go to slideshow. Um, and we will get into this thing. If I can make this thing go to where I want it. There we go from the beginning. Excellent. So everybody look at this logo and look very carefully and let it sort of be ingrained in your brain because over the next month or two, this logo will go away. We are building out a brand new logo. Uh, if you go to our website and you go to raptorquest.org, you go to our Instagram, uh, Facebook, Facebook and Twitter, we haven't really used yet. Facebook, maybe. We're putting out a new iconic logo. We're sort of upping our brand. Um, this logo is the fourth iteration since we were founded back in the 1980s. And we're going to a new, bolder look. Um, mission's still the same. Service is still the same. What we do is the same. We're just kind of you know, refreshing a little bit. And we thought that COVID was the perfect time to do it. Um, uh, who is this good looking guy? Well, that's me. Um, and that is Dudley. Uh, sadly, Dudley passed away a number of years ago, but I love this picture because um, Dudley was one of these iconic birds. He was with us for 28 years. Uh, he was 30 years old when he passed. Uh, he met, I can't tell you how many governors, uh, generals. He went to Fort Bragg on a number of occasions, U.S. senators, just so many dignitaries and then thousands upon thousands upon thousands of school children. Actually, uh, posthumously, Dudley was awarded the Owl of the Year Award internationally. There's such a thing. We had to submit his application. I actually went to Minnesota in winter. Why they would do a program in Minnesota in the wintertime is beyond me, but I went up there a number of years ago and accepted the award on behalf of Dudley. And there literally were people there. They were Owl Nut. It's the International Owl Festival. It's in Houston, Minnesota. And there were Owl people from around the world. And Dudley was the Owl of the Year because of his service and work that he had done in the community. So if you ever want to reach out to me, that's my contact information. Uh, please give me a call. Bill knows that we love to have people out there. We are open to the public right now, Wednesday through Sunday. We have restricted uh, admissions because of COVID. So we have a morning session from 10 to 1230 and an afternoon session from 130 to 4. We want folks to buy your tickets online. You can get them right on your phone, bring them up, show us what's going on, and we'll bring you in. We do require masks. Um, we're doing a lot of things inside. We've gone with uh, touchless faucets and a lot of others. But outside's very safe, right? 
I mean, inside you're sort of you around other people. There's the, the respiration going on outside. We feel that we're a great place for people to come to. So what we're going to talk about today is really Raptors, our mission, the future, and how you guys literally as part of this leadership group can support us. So the first thing, uh, I can't really see everybody right now, but nodding of your head, showing of your hands, you know, raise your hand. How many of you think that's what the Carolina Raptor Center does? Okay. Well, guess what? Those of you that said yes, pretty much. Um, because the ornithological school of thought now is that the majority of the dinosaurs did not have scales, but had feathers, including Velociraptor. And some are even thinking T-Rex. So where we thought they were more related to the reptiles of the world, we think that a lot of them had a lot more in common with the birds of the world. And we're gonna be unveiling a new raptor species that we have brought in. Uh, can't really tell you now because it's one of those drum roll big moments, but we have one of the coolest birds on the face of the planet that we now have over on our non-public side, getting ready for a public unveiling. And when you see this bird, you literally will think you're looking at a dinosaur, something out of the Jurassic age. It's just, it's insane. But no, we're not talking about dinosaurs. We're talking about birds, but to us, birds are dinosaurs. All right, so this is a picture of a Eurasian eagle owl. This is during one of our photo shoots that we do. And I want you to be thinking in your head and really I can't, it's not participatory. I don't have you out there, but what makes a raptor a raptor? Okay, what is it? Well, easy, it's a bird. That's the first thing. So what are some other things that make raptors raptors? Well, they have excellent eyesight and that is a golden eagle. You can tell it's a golden versus one of the hawks or a juvenile ball because if you can kind of see around his back of his head, that nap of that neck is extremely golden. Those beautiful gold feathers, that's where they get their name. So all raptors, whether they're diurnal during the day or the nocturnal during the night, the owls, the hawks, the eagles, the falcons, whatever, had tremendous, unbelievable eyesight. It's almost like binocular or telescopic in that they can zoom out to thousands of feet or zoom in right to here. It's, it's incredible, their eyesight. Curved, sharp beak. One of those physical things that you absolutely can see. This is a bald eagle that we have down there. Here again, that prominent white head, that beautiful yellow beak. Every raptor has that curved, sharp beak. Think of it as their steak knife, right? That's what they're ripping their food with. They all have the incredible strong claws, or we call them talons. Uh, they have four per foot, just massive, depending on the size of the bird. And the strength of these birds is incredible. If you can see that golden eagle that's up there in the top, well, that golden eagle has a grip strength of about six to 700 pounds per square inch. Okay, think about that. It's not, it, so it gives you something to think about. An average male, strong male, has about 80. So if I was grabbing something, I'd have a grip strength of about 80 pounds per square inch. That bird's got it over 700. It's insane how strong they are. And then one of the last things is they eat other animals. Raptors are not vegetarians. They don't wanna eat that bird seed that you put out there in your backyard. They're not gonna eat the suet. They don't want berries on bushes. They will eat the birds that are eating the bird seed, but they don't wanna eat anything but other animals. And that's sort of kind of loosely because worms, you know, a lot of raptors will eat worms, a lot of raptors will eat insects, but overall they are hunters. They're the apex of the food chain. So what are we? Well, we're a rehabilitation hospital. We're actually after a hospital in the United States by birds admitted. Okay. We see depending on a given year, about a thousand birds a year. COVID, for example, restricted us to about 690 in 2020. We were on par to hit a bunch of birds until COVID hit. And then we didn't accept any new birds coming into the hospital. We couldn't have 
volunteers go out. We couldn't have the public coming in. So it really restricted our ability to serve birds from all, and we were getting, we get birds from all over North and South Carolina, not just Mecklenburg County, but from the Outer Banks to the mountains to upstate South Carolina, we get calls from all over. And we're also consider us like that uh, Atrium Health or, or Novant, we are the big trauma center. And so they'll go to other facilities and then get brought to us. They'll go to Riverbank Zoo or to the North Carolina um, Zoological Park in Ashboro. We then will get those birds. And so they're native birds that we want to take in, treat and release. That's an osprey right there. And we know that part of Lake Norman has just got lots of ospreys. They're all over the lake. We're an education center both native, so you could see birds like this that we have on display. We also have birds from around the world. We have birds from Australia, we have birds from South America, we have birds from Central America, uh, Asia, Africa, worldwide, we have birds that are on display. We're a bird zoo. Um, so they're permanent residents are with us all the time. And then I could say we get some really phenomenal birds that come to us from other places. I'm sorry, I got a phone ringing that I can't turn off. So we'll just let it ring for a minute. Um, so these are some examples you've got up in that far left-hand corner, that cuddly looking little thing. Well, that's a barn owl baby. You got that peregrine falcon. You've got the turkey vulture. You've got all these different birds. These are birds that we have, including the bird that you see down there at the bottom right, that funky looking thing kind of looks like a roadrunner. Well, that is a red-legged Sariyama. You should Google that, red leg Siriyama. They are native to South America. That bird stands about three and a half to four feet tall. It'll come up to your waist. And that is a funky bird that has a funky call and they're just, they're magnificent. So that's one of the differences that we have. And that middle bird that you see right there with that beautiful dark coloration and those red sort of wrist or shoulders look, that's a Harris's hawk, and they would be found in southwestern United States, so Texas, Arizona, New Mexico. Uh, that one that you see flying down there on the bottom, Eurasian eagle owl, that's one of the largest species of owls on the planet, and that bird's from northern Europe. So think, you know, Scandinavia, across Germany, over into Russia and that area. So this is our mission. This is who we are. We ignite imagination and inspire engagement. We want people to be connected to nature, but using birds as the hook. Um, we want people to want to explore and do more. And we use these great, beautiful birds of prey. That's a barn owl right there that we see, one of our just unbelievable birds. This is just sort of an example of some of the things we do with some of the volunteers that we have. You've got folks up there at the top, TIAA, one of our great corporate sports supporters, that's they built a new enclosure for us. We're all over in different communities. We're doing volunteer work. That middle sort of thing is one thing that we did for the 4th of July at a, at a local um, brewery. We like to have fun. We like to go to breweries. So we did some things there. We just go out into the community and try to do a little bit of everything. See at the very bottom uh, left-hand panel, that's one of the birds that came through the hospital and we were able to release. So that's a success story. Um, but we really feel that our mission is to connect people. It is to take care of birds, but we really need to make that connection between people and the environment. We're sort of the matchmaker between the two. So as Bill was saying, we're very excited about the future. Um, COVID sort of put the future on pause a little bit or slowed it down. We won't say it stopped it, but this is the new building that we're calling Quest. This building actually is built. Um, it's ready to go. It has exhibits inside. It's, it's about 13,000 square feet. If you're coming into Latta, um, if you're familiar with where we currently are, you'd come down Babies Ford Road. You'd turn on Sample Road right there at Hopewell Presbyterian. Just come down Sample just a little bit. You'll come through the new gates that say Latta Nature Preserve. And right to your right is this beautiful new facility called Quest. And we wouldn't be able to do this if it wasn't for Mecklenburg County Park and Recreation. We're partners in this facility. But it has brand new indoor classrooms, big new conference uh, center, um, catering kitchen, um, 6,000 gallon aquarium that will highlight uh, the fish that would you see on the Catawba River system. So Lake Norman, Mountain Island Lake, all of that would be a part of that. Gift shop, patio out the back. We will be able to serve alcohol. So for events and various things, food truck. So really a destination for people. So you can come to Latta, 
and not just have to do one thing and leave, but you can come to Lada and see the raptors. You can come to Lada and see the fish. You can come to Lada, do a Segway tour. And so you literally could make a day or several days by doing things within the preserve. And so we're extremely excited. Again, the building is ready to go. It's just the county is apprehensive about opening it with COVID. So we're just sort of waiting for COVID to sort of dissipate a little bit, and then we'll be opening it up. We said opening in the fall, well, that didn't quite happen. So we're now hoping summer of 2021. Again, it is a partnership with the county. It's focused on how we can inspire water because one of the big pieces is the county's theme is nothing survives without water. And it really talks about the importance of Mountain Island Lake. I'm not gonna ask again for a show of hands, but do you know where you get your drinking water if you're in Mecklenburg County and you turn on your faucet? It comes out of Mountain Island Lake. We are the watershed. That's why that's a protected lake. And that's why it's very important that we maintain the buffer around Latta. And then it's going to be, again, very inclusive, very interactive. If you've been to the old, when Bill and I are, are dinosaurs, literally, when we were growing up, you'd go to a nature center and you'd just read a bunch of signs, right? There wasn't a lot of, you'd see stuff under glass, but there wasn't a lot of stuff to do. This building's different. There's a lot of hands-on, interactive, cool things to get people participating. This is sort of the overview. And again, all of this grading is done. We've actually started building some of these enclosures. We're starting to work on the uh, Duke Energy Amphitheater and some of the other things out there. Again, I talked about the Duke Energy Amphitheater. It'll be a 200 seat amphitheater. Our current amphitheater is about 80. It'll be the largest outdoor venue in this part of the county. And don't just think bird shows. We're not just gonna have our uh, wings of wonder, but think musical performances, uh, plays, concerts, film festivals. We will say like the Davidson Players, uh, Charlotte Folk Music Society, a lot of different groups so they can come out here and perform in a smaller intimate venue. One of the first things I want to do is I want to hold a film festival. What do you think the very first film I want to host would be? And you guys can tell me this. What do you think? What would be a movie that I want to show the public? Well, not Jurassic Park. <laughs> That'd be a good one. That's probably going to come, but this is even more related than that, Bill. That's a great Alfred, Alfred Hitchcock. <laughs> yes, the birds. We're going to show the birds because we literally have ravens and crows and stuff. And so can you imagine sitting in the venue at night and this crow flies right over your head while that crow's pecking those people? How cool would that be? So we are. We're going to do that. We're going to show the, the movie. Red bird care facility, think of it, urgent care and wellness for our birds. It's gonna be there. Outdoor classroom, it'll be sheltered uh, so people can come out. And again, a lot of these different things are reservable or rentable. So if a corporation's coming into town and they want a space to have a nice event, they could rent it and be out there. You see those little things that we're calling neighborhoods. There's three of them with all those little enclosures. Well, there'll be 40 enclosures that we have out there that will be, be able to have the birds we actually, and when people ask me this question, they go, well, how many current species of birds do you have now? And I said, well, we got about 30. So what does that tell you? Well, we're going to have 10 more different cool species of birds that we're going to be able to have. Just quickly by the numbers, we're currently on 57 and a third acres. This new facility will give us another 20 plus acres. We see about 1,000 patients annually outside of COVID. We see about 75,000 people a year, not with COVID. That was about a third, if not that. I mean, we, we literally had to shut down operations and then went virtual. We're not seeing as many school kids. We're doing virtual. So that was a positive pivot. We're able to now do programs virtually um, and people from all over the United States can take advantage of our programs. Just like this, they can zoom in and, and be a part of a program without having to drive to the Raptor Center. And we're making money doing it. And we still have about 20 something staff. The very positive is out of this, we were able to get PPP funding. We got first round, which is the Paycheck Protection Program, the federal program. We got first round and second round. So we were able to get funding both times. We also got a small business administration, uh, economic injury disaster loan, which helped us through this. And then we got local funding through the CARES Act. So we were able to get financial support in a time when we could 
not have done it. For example, you guys have seen a lot of the financial. Just the last quarter in our fiscal year, which would have been April, May, and June of last year, we lost 70% of our operating revenue in one quarter. It was insane. We should be normally about a $1.3 million budget. We were under $900,000 for the year. So we didn't have the money coming in, but we still have staff to pay and birds to take care of. And so we had to be very, very uh, flexible and adaptive on how we were able to. And a lot of a lot of people in the community stepped up as they did with a lot of nonprofits and charitable groups. They saw what we were going through. They were able to, to make some, some changes. Um, in the time of COVID, people actually did better because if you don't have to commute, you're working remotely, you're saving on gas, you don't have to rent a parking space, all these things. And so a lot of our donors say, hey, I'm actually making more money now working remotely than I did when I was having to go into the office. And they supported us with that. So how can you help? Well, that's a question I want to pose to you. So think just a minute. That's a little screech owl, by the way, a little Eastern screech owl. You can volunteer and we are accepting volunteers. We start volunteering. We actually have a high school volunteer program. We do interns with high schools. So if you're interested in a wildlife, yes, but also think we're a business. So we have a retail merchandising area. We have a business side. We've got an education side. And so not just, you don't have to just want to be a vet or uh, environmentalist. You can want to run a work for a business, but that has an iron environmental natural theme to it. Practice stewardship, very simple things you can do. I'm gonna tell you this very quickly. When you're driving down the highway, don't throw that apple core out the window. That apple core in turn draws the small rodents, you know, the squirrels, the the rats, the rabbits to the side of the road, those hawks and owls sitting up on the side of I-77 or Beatty's Ford or 21 or 115 or the highways, they see that little rodent, they go flying down and they get bought by a car. Number one cause of injury that we see in our hospitals hit by car, hundreds of patients a year. So if you just don't throw anything out your car window, you'll make our life so much easier. And then you can be a community partner. Um, Companies or community partners, actually groups or community partners. Uh, you know, your leadership junior group could be one of our community partners and come out and do service projects as a group, just like TIAA. Leadership Charlotte's been out. Uh, leadership Lake Norman did a project with us a number of years ago. I think you actually painted one of the enclosures, Bill, uh, and did some things. And of course, these are just some of our volunteers doing cleaning doing dose that's our sore program down at the bottom um, left that's just a young man who's leading a group of young folks doing everything that we've got out on the trail use manual traps don't use rodenticide we joke and if you do catch mice bring them to us we'll feed them to the birds saves us money keep the trash in your car and then there's just this is a group from TIAA. They were coming out literally every month until COVID hit. Uh, hundreds of folks came out from them and it was doing work for us. So, and with that, I will uh, be quiet and uh, kind of let you guys ask questions if you want. If not, Bill, thank you again for just this opportunity. You know, we anything we can ever do for the Lake Norman Chamber, he knows that he does not ever want to hesitate because we will do it for him. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate it very much. And I'll stop sharing and go ahead and and next time anybody asks you, tell you, tell them that I actually did that <laughs> by myself and it worked. We really appreciate it, Jim, and thank you so very much. And, and uh, you can either stay on with us or uh, go back to uh, doing the things you need to do. I may stay for a little while, Bill, but thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, now we have uh, Rodrigo. He is with Visit Lake Norman. Uh, many of you, when you come here or did come here to as a launching port for going out, you were in the Visit Lake Norman's Visitor Center. Uh, we would have started there this morning, and Rodrigo is going to give you an overview of Visitor Center, which has a lot of products. But... Rodrigo, I'm going to turn uh, the controls over to you, um, and uh, let's see here. And you are now a co-host, so you can share your screen and any kind of PowerPoint or anything you might have. All right. Thank you, Bill. Um, can everyone see my screen? Mm -hmm. 
All right. Let's see. So again, good afternoon, everyone. Um, happy to be hosting this uh, this presentation on behalf of VLN. My name is Rodrigo Carrion. I'm the Visitor Services and Marketing Coordinator. We are the visitor center that's located off West Catawba Avenue. We share office space with the Chamber of Commerce, so we're right, right beside of them. Um, we're the organization that's uh, dedicated to promoting the towns of Cornelius, Davidson, and Huntersville. We have an 18-person board that has a mixture of elected officials and different community partners, attractions, and restaurant partners. We're a small team of five. We have Cindy Bartley, our operations and marketing director, our executive director, Sally Ashford, our director of sales, Travis Dancy, and then we also have a graphic designer, Jenny Lang, who's not pictured in that image. We also have a team of ambassadors and interns that help cover the visitor center. Um, so they're the ones helping out, um, greeting visitors coming in, taking in phone calls, answering any questions that people might have about the area. And then we also tally up those, uh, those hours that they assist us with, which ended up totaling about $93,000 in cost savings. Um, some of the things that our ambassadors and interns do, they help, like I said, cover the visitor center at the front desk, taking phone calls. But whenever we have, you know, those major festivals coming into the area, like your Ren Carolina Renaissance Festival, your Scottish Festival at Rural Hill, the Joe Gibbs Racing Fan Fest, we usually have an information booth because there's a lot of people coming from out of town looking for things to do, places to eat. So we have our ambassadors staff those as well. Um, and there's a couple pictures from the events that we've been able to have that info booth in previous years. Our internship program, there are different roles that um, we have college, college um, students help us with. So there's marketing internships available sports marketing internships, graphic design and photography. Um, so I know you guys are juniors and seniors in high school, but you know once you're in college and if you have a interest in the hospitality and tourism industry, or you know you, you have a marketing, your marketing degree, a sports marketing degree or graphic design, feel free to, to reach out to us um, regarding any of those opportunities once, once you're in college. So just to tell you a little bit about the internship program itself, um, we have it usually year round. Um, they help us with content generation on website and blogs. They help create social media content calendars, posts on social media too. Um, they help create campaigns and contests. We have an annual Capture Lake Norman photo contest that runs every year. We just concluded that a couple months ago and it was probably one of the best ones that we've had. And then we also have promotional flyers that they help us build out. So not all of the attractions and restaurants have brochures um, that they make themselves. So we have some of the interns help us in creating some of those flyers for them so that we can display that in our visitor center for people to pick up um, as well. They, like I said, they help staff informational booths at those major annual events. And they also get to attend networking events. And um, we really try and tailor the internship experience to those interests that the interns express that they, that they like to do so whenever people come by the visitor center, we have a tracking sheet where we obviously track where people are coming from and, and why people are coming to Lake Norman and, and why they're stopping by the visitor center. So last year, um, the top 10 states that we were getting visitors from, number one was of course, North Carolina uh, being a drive-in drive market. But the first state that was from out of town or first out of state was Ohio followed by New York, Pennsylvania, Florida, New Jersey, Michigan, Virginia, California, and Maryland. So you'll notice we get people from, a, a lot of people from the North um, and from the South as well. Just some quick North Carolina and Mecklenburg County tourism facts. In 2019, domestic visitors spent a record of over $26 billion statewide, which was an increase of 5% from 2018. Uh, visitor expenditures directly supported over 235,000 jobs across the state. And a neat fact, uh, North Carolina continues to be the sixth most visited state in the nation with 58 million person trips in 2019. So 
like I said, our primary goal is to recruit events that have that overnight impact in our, in our towns of Cornelius, Davidson, and Huntersville. So we recruit sporting events, different tournaments, such as your youth, baseball, softball tournaments, um, tennis tournaments, soccer, as well as uh, fishing tournaments, of course. So we do promote the towns of Cornelius, Davidson, and Huntersville. We have 19 hotels that we work with to try and get as many people to stay uh, from those events and then also extend their stays as well. So due to COVID, we did have a couple of events that were postponed to this year that were originally scheduled for last year. So we'll have the USTA and North Carolina 18 plus tennis state championships coming in June 17th through the 20th. And then we'll also have the Charlotte Dragon Boat Festival coming from coming to, coming to the area October 16th to Ramsey Creek Park. And then we'll have the Carolina Renaissance Festival back October to November. Some of the lost uh, estimated economic impact that we had from the events being postponed or canceled last year totaled to about $3 million in, in, in losses. So that was just a combination of different um, youth baseball and softball tournaments, Dragon Boat and Asian Festival that was originally scheduled for last year, the Symmetric Classic um, Golf Tournament as well, Tennis State Championships. But even in the midst of the pandemic last year, we were able to host, um, safely host some of the uh, sporting events that we would usually have. So in July, we were able to host the Top Gun Softball Summer World Series. Um, and then later in the year, in October, we had several events, a couple fishing tournaments. So we had the FLW Toyota Series fishing tournament, as well as the Carolina Bass Challenge um, Classic. And then the same weekend that we had that fishing tournament, we had the state games adult um, event followed by the Symmetric Tour Championship a couple of weeks later after that. So in our visitor center, we have just rows of brochures and information that informs people of all the restaurants and attractions that we have in the area. So we do have a couple of tear off maps um, to help showcase what uh, amenities the area has. Um, so we have a comprehensive tear off map that has attractions, shopping, hotels, parks, and breweries. And then we also have a dedicated brewery and winery trial map that has all the breweries and wineries in the area as well as our visitor's guide that we have in our hotels too. So we really pride ourselves from having the ambassador and internship program, which actually won a gold award and uh, Best Community Relations and Destination Marketing Achievement Award a couple years ago. And then we also received the Platinum Award for the Best Meetings and Convention uh, Comprehensive Venue Guide that we have that just lists all the different places that uh, people can have and host meetings. So of course, COVID-19, you know, impacting the tourism industry, we're keeping track of the travel or sentiment market indicators. And some of those um, figures are, you know, starting to get you know, be encouraging. 44% um, of travelers indicate they'll take road trips. 53% are replacing long haul trips with regional destinations. Some of the better motivators for people to travel are actually beaches and lakes. So, you know, we have a lot of, uh, we, of course we have Lake Norman, so it's easier for people to, to be motivated to visit us. And then visiting friends and family is the second. And then discounts and deals will help influence travel decisions. Nearly half of those travelers are gonna be planning staycations. So most of those trips will be closer to home. So with COVID-19, um, on the, staying on the topic, we've had to pivot on the marketing side. So we've had to update our website so that it has language. So whenever someone stops by, visits our, our website online, they'll be able to see what um, updates the North Carolina governor has uh, mandated to ensure everyone's safety. So we'll have that on the top red banner that you see on the, on the homepage. We've also created blogs um, and even created a dedicated COVID-19 landing page that has just updates as we hear of them in the news. Um, we also have links for general tourism efforts, rapid recovery loans that help 
local restaurants uh, and hospitality partners. So on the state level, they initiated a program called Count On Me NC. You might have seen it you know, on a commercial or billboard on the side of the road, but basically what it is, it's a public health initiative that empowers guests and businesses to help keep everyone safe from COVID-19. It's a training session that restaurants and hotels can take that you know, encourages them to, to practice social distancing and put in place uh, safety precautions uh, to keep everyone safe. And then once they've taken that certification, they'll get a certificate that they can display you know, at the front entrance of their establishment. And then we'll also list them on our dedicated COVID-19 uh, Count On Me NC page on our website. So these are some participating restaurants and hotels that have already taken that initiative as well. At the beginning of the pandemic, we had to um, create a dedicated lakeside and curbside page to inform of those people of those restaurants that were open for delivery, takeout, um, curbside pickup, and then also um, you know, our waterfront restaurants that were letting uh, boaters pull up to the dock and, and take food out there as well. Um, but we also had a virtual tip jar that was open for a couple of months. So we encouraged people to, you know, anytime that they would have a nice dinner at home or they would, you know, make some drinks at home, if they were feeling, uh, you know, nice, we would encourage them to, to donate to the virtual tip jar, which uh, helped someone that was either laid off or furloughed uh, a local industry service worker because of the restaurants being closed for a couple of months at the beginning of the pandemic. We also created a Stream Lake Norman page. So at the beginning of the pandemic, when people weren't really traveling, um, we were still trying to make sure that people kept Lake Norman in the back of their minds. So we had different live streams that we linked to our website. So the Carolina Raptor Center um, had live streams that they were doing on a daily basis. The Historic Lada Plantation set up a uh, video series that we put on on our on our page as well and it was just a good way for for people to uh, you know like I said keep Lake Norman in, in the back of their minds we also had zoom backgrounds available um, for people to download and use and that's still up on our website too so I encourage you to use those and then we also have coloring pages um, as well that you can download and, and color in so at the beginning of last year, we were able to set up an online store uh, before COVID uh, happened, um, just to expand the Lake Norman merchandise that we have uh, in our visitor center, because our visitor center has a gift shop. So we offer a variety of hats, ornaments, keychains, postcards, wine glasses, beer glasses, shirts, and different apparel. Um, but we set up our online store just in time at the beginning of February. And come March, when COVID happened, our visitor center had to close down for a couple months, but we were still able to ship out orders locally and even across the country as well. So this is just a, a screenshot of our online store. Um, as you can see, we just have a variety of different sweatshirts, uh, keychain shirts. Um, you select your size, you can even personalize uh, a, a message that you can send with a care package that we've also put together on your behalf. Um, so you just choose the items you want, customize the message, and then we'll box it all together with the message that you get, and we'll ship it on your behalf. So this is just a screenshot of some of the blogs that we've um, published in the past couple months, um, different barbecue spots. Uh, we've also contacted restaurants for a Q&A and then to get a recipe from them that they would be willing to share. Um, outdoor patio dining restaurants. We also contacted local breweries for a Bruising Cues a series that we started, diving into the historical restaurants in Cornelius, Staveton, and Huntersville. And then we also pushed out our nature therapy campaign as well. This is just a screenshot of that campaign that we pushed out um, with nature therapy that was published in, in our, our state magazine in July. So our visitor center was closed for a couple months from March up until Memorial Day weekend. Um, and then when we reopened, we had to put in place uh, some social distancing stickers that you'll see on the right-hand side. 
We also have a pickup table where there's packets of information just ready for people to pick up and limit them um, from browsing those brochures. And we also had sneeze shields and hand sanitizer dispensers installed in our visitor center too. And then at the end of our presentations, we like to uh, play a little game. So I think if you have the ability to use the chat function, we'll do it that way. But I'll ask a question and then you can just type in the chat box your answer and then I'll write your name down. And then we'll uh, have a prize ready to be picked up at the visitor center as well. Um, either Bill or Sylvia can, can send you our address and then you can just stop by our visitor center to, to pick those items up. So the first question is, um, let's see. In terms of visitation, what place is North Carolina ranked in the nation? And we'll check at the chat. So it's not first. It was one of those neat uh, quick tourism facts that I shared close to the beginning of the presentation. It's not 30th. Uh, Ella's close. <laughs> okay, yep, Case, Case, uh, Case Maddox. Yep, we are the sixth most visited state. So I'll write your name down and I'll pull a, a gift for you that you can just pick up at the visitor center. All right, our second question. What are the different ways that people can access our blogs? That's right. I think, yep, Ella, Ella got that. Ella Hughes. Y'all are good. So we have our monthly e-newsletter, our website, and then of course, social media, Facebook and Instagram. And the third and last question, What is the name of the public health initiative that empowers guests and businesses to help keep everyone safe during COVID-19? Okay, said count on me. Yeah. So case one again. Case one again, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he's smarter than the uh, average traveler. What if? That's right, yeah. So, uh, yeah, Case, we'll have a couple of different items for you to pick up. And then Ella Hughes will also have an item for you to, to pick up too. But that, uh, that concludes my presentation. Um, if you guys have any questions, please don't hesitate to, to ask me. I'm happy to, to help out. Any questions you might have? And Bill, thank you again for, for this opportunity to share a little bit about what Visit Like Norman's about. Sure, that was absolutely great. Um, again, I wanna thank all the, uh, the speakers that we had. We had Zach Brown who came on and talked about the HFA, Mariana Doble, shared a little bit about uh, David's Village Inn and hospitality. Uh, Jim Warren, who did an excellent program on the, on the Raptor Center. And let me just say to the students, uh, if you get a chance, please go out to the Raptor Center loaded, located in Huntersville when, when everything gets going again. It is a fantastic experience seeing some of those Raptors that they have. And Rodrigo, uh, again, thank you so very much and, and all the folks that uh, visit Lake Norman. That concludes our program. Hopefully next month uh, to our students, uh, we'll have a lot of COVID behind us and hopefully we can get back on to a schedule of either economic development or community infrastructure and uh, do some hands-on again going out 
And I, I'm sorry we couldn't uh, do that today. Inclement weather, I really thought it was going to be a bad day, and it turned out not to be as bad as we, we thought. But uh, I want to thank all the students. This will be, uh, this is being recorded, and we're going to put it out on the uh, Junior Leadership Lake Norman uh, Facebook page, but I'll also email it to all the all the participants, and uh, feel free to share it with your friends and family, because it's, it's not necessarily uh, something that we're having just for leader, leadership like Norman. You can share it with your friends if you like. So again, thank you, everybody, and uh, appreciate uh, everybody being part of today's program. Thanks, Bill. Thank, thank you so much.